Thank you very much for inviting me to speak about one of my favorite topics. And thank you all for coming to join us today. I'm just going to share the um, presentation so we can all see what I'm talking about. Here it is. And now it's presented nicely. Well, <clears throat> let's dive right in to the Haggadah. So in our Seder, as we um, celebrate it today, most, uh, most widely, there are several layers of time and history and celebration going on at once. And we start from, you know, the biblical events of, uh, that predate the slavery uh, in Egypt and all kinds of stories that are kind of leading up to and that we mention. And then we have the story of Egypt and then how it was celebrated uh, when there was a temple, you know, the korban that was uh, the sacrifice of the lamb that was brought the, the day before and eaten together in family ceremonies. Then we move to contemporary Pesach, how it was celebrated since they stopped um, bringing the korban for the uh, holiday. And through most of the exile and different uh, periods in, in history, a lot of things happened, but the Pesach Seder stayed pretty much the same um, for uh, several good, you know, thousand something years. And, but every um, Pesach, we also look forward towards the future, towards a different kind of um, Pesach. Every community where it's at in, in its point in time in history will think conceptualize that future redemption of Passover in a different way. And now I'm taking you back to the end of the Middle Ages in Ashkenaz, which is the area of German speaking lands. You know, Germany wasn't itself a coalesced um, political unit until the 19th, uh, the 20th century, 19th, 20th century. So we're in lands that spoke German and Jews um, we're living in this space called Ashkenaz. And in this Galut, in this diaspora of um, medieval and early modern Ashkenaz, this wonderful um, guest started to appear at the Sedem. And I would like to take you on this journey of how different elements came together and thing and, and different um, different mean hagim, different rituals came together and all became associated with Elijah the prophet. And why? Why is he the one chosen to come and join us every year at our seder? Or seders, sometimes we have two. Okay, so we have three main parts, uh, three main rituals that came together to create this um, ritual of hosting Eliyahu at the seder. We open the door, we say Shvo Hamatcha, it's a series of verses, four verses um, that we will see soon. And there is a cup of wine. Now, each one of these elements had a independent development. They um, were, each one of them can be traced in different ways and we're gonna go through them quickly, but they're each, they're subject of their own inquiry. And then we'll see how they were all pulled together. We're going to start with the door, opening the door. Why are we doing this? So one idea is that you open your door when you feel sure of yourself. When you feel protected and you feel safe, you do not hide behind a closed door. And uh, maybe some of us can um, relate to this feeling from over the past year, how much was our door opened or shut as opposed to other years and in our interactions, um, our everyday interactions of, uh, in our neighborhoods and around our homes or our offices. But Passover night is supposed to be a night where we are protected. It is a special night that since it was the night that was leaving Egypt, it is a night that is called Lel Shimurim, Shamur. It's also 
in, in English, it's translated as a night of vi vigil, of keeping up and keeping watch. But the Hebrew language gives us a lot of room for interpretation. And it's also shamur as to protect, but and also mishumau, it's saved. You know, like a can of, of, um, of food is a kusat shimurim, it's being preserved. Where is it preserved? From the, the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah tells us, Rabbi Yoshua tells us that this night was preserved from the six days of creation. So it is a special night um, set out on the calendar since the days of creation that on this night, the, fifth, the night of the 15th day of Nisan will be a night of redemption. And the first time it happened is, um, well, the biggest event that it happens is coming out of Egypt, the redemption from Egypt, but there are different Midrashic um, stories about it happened, this night being special for redemption along different uh, time points in history. One very nice um, uh, poem that, ex that uh, explores different times that this night um, was a night of redemption is, um, one of the, uh, the poems that we say at the end of the Seder, and they uh, explain other times that redemptions happened around the time of Passover or in the middle of the night. And so we have this idea that this night retains its essence of vigil and this essence that God looks to protect his people on this night. And following from the verse in Shemot and also in the um, Gemara and Rosh Hashanah that discusses the night. And then we see what, what is done, what action is done to show this um, understanding of the night. Okay, so the idea is that it is the night of vigil. God is watching over and preserving um, the um, preserving the safety of the Jewish people on this night. So how do you show this? By opening the door. And the Or Zerua, living in Vienna in the end of the 12th and beginning of the 13th century, writes, I have read in Rav Nisim Gaon. So here we see an idea that's traveling throughout the Jewish diaspora, coming from North Africa in the 10th and 11th century up through uh, the migration of Jewish scholars and manuscripts and um, reaching you know, Vienna, which is uh, an Eastern frontier of Jewish settlement at the time. And he says, in the name of Rav Nisim Gaon, it is written in the name of his father, okay? So we have here kind of the idea of Passover, of Higadetelevanecha, ideas that go from father to son of how to um, make, how this night is supposed to um, encapsulate the ideas and how our actions bring forth what we want to uh, preserve from generation to generation. So Rav Nisim Gaon is writing what his father taught him and Or Zavra, Rabbi Yitzchak of, of Vienna is bringing it down not to lock the doors of the house on Passover night, because this shows faith in the word of God and his promise. By the merit of our faith, we will be rewarded redemption. And you find that our forefathers were redeemed from Egypt because of faith. And it says, and the people believed. So here we have an action. Leaving the doors open symbolizes that we believe this is in fact a night of vigil. This is in fact an opportunity for redemption. And by leaving the door open, we are showing that we are ready for that redemption. So we have a relationship here, a dialogue about um, between the people and God saying here, we know, we remember, we believe. Now, you see that we're serious. You see that we haven't forgotten. 
don't forget us as well. This is the time. We are ready and waiting. And in mer this is a, a merit that faith itself and showing in action of opening the door to faith will bring about and initiate a pr the process of redemption to begin happening. Now we're gonna take it one step further and we are going to go about 200, 250 years in the future to Rabbi Israel Bruna, the chief rabbi of Regensburg, who is quoting from the Orzara. And he already places the opening of the door in a specific time. The Orzara only said that we do leave, that we do not lock the doors at night. Now this can be understood in different ways. It could be opening the door in the beginning of the night. It could be leaving the doors unlocked throughout the night, even when you go to sleep. But it's not tied down to a specific time during the Seder. Um, there is one opinion that the idea of opening the door was at the beginning of the Seder, because when we say, we're opening the door and saying, whoever needs a place should come and join us. So it's a lot, makes a lot of sense to open the door and invite people. Um, the mechanics work a lot better if you're telling someone to come in and the door's already open. I mean, we're, we're gonna see that with, with uh, that if we expect that to work with, uh, with Elijah, then we should expect it, you know, it, it would be, a good idea to do that with the poor people around us also. So maybe they opened the, the door was opened in the beginning, maybe the door was open throughout, maybe the door was not locked. There are several options. But here already in 15th century Regensburg, there is a specific time that the um, door is opened. Okay? It is customary to open the door while reciting Shvoch according to what is written in the Or Zerua, not to lock the doors on the Pesach night as it is a night of vigil. And this is faith in God and his promise. And by the merit of his promise, we will be redeemed. And for this, we open the door at Shvoch. That is, by this, it is worthy for the arrival of Messiah. So here, we are already going a step forward. We have connected opening the door to the recitation of certain verses, and it is connected not only to the general idea of redemption, that God will redeem, but also to waiting for a specific redeemer. We want Mashiach to come to us. That will be the beginning of the redemption. So let's go, we've seen what opening the door, the element of opening the door, now let's see the element of Shvoch HaMatcha. It's, uh, these verses were added to the text of the Haggadah sometime probably in the 12th century. And they are very difficult and they show um, an anger and a frustration with the current historical reality that the communities of Ashkenaz were feeling in the 12th century. The crusade, first crusade of 1096 was a very big blow to the communities of Ashkenaz and especially the strong established communities of the Rhine Valley, Worms, Spire, um, and Magenza. And they suffered from the uh, crusading armies that were coming through on their way. They, um, there was the call of the Pope to go to the Holy Land, and redeem the holy sites from the hands of the Muslims. And on the way, um, the Jewish communities were, were um, massacred and there's a lot of, you know, um, plundered and a lot of very, very difficult stories and you know, very um, heartbreaking situations that were recorded in Chronicles. And it became a, 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 fun, a fundamental shift in the way that Jews and Ashkenaz understood themselves and understood 
their place in their surrounding communities. And it, the memory, the communal memory of the 1096 Crusader pogroms were um, for overshadowed a lot of how the Ashkenazi communities handled themselves for the next um, few hundred years. And um, the verses added of pour out your wrath and fury on the nations show how there's this shift towards wanting or um, hoping for a redemption that also includes an element of vengeance. So the, the idea of vengeance of eventual redemption is not an Ashkenazi uh, invention. It is present to a degree in earlier sources. And there are um, um, late medieval, late, um, From, from the 6th and 7th and 8th century, there are all kinds of texts that are talk about redemption and talk about Yemot HaMashiach, uh, such as Sefer Zubavel, which is a very famous one. But there are all kinds of, of um, stories and, and ideas and conceptions of what will be at the end of days going around. And the element of vengeance exists in them in late antiquity. But the Ashkenazi jewelry brought this idea to the forefront and made it a key element of the redemption that they are hoping for, and also an element that they want to see happen pretty early in the process of redemption. As in, Mashiach comes, there's a vengeance of, against the uh, nations that cause them harm and make their lives difficult for being good Jews and it will be the God will uh, take out you know his uh, his wrath on them and then they will move to the next uh, next level of, of redemption towards um, getting to Eretz Israel uh, collect in collecting of the of the diaspora building the temple those things will happen later so we have the, these verses and they are connected to opening the door and connected to the idea of, of the redemption. So now we have two of the elements connected together and it is put in the words, very nicely in the words of Matei Moshe, and we have already now crossed into the 16th century. It is our custom to open the door, to remember that it is a night of vigil, okay, we have that. And by merit of this faith, the Messiah will come and pour his wrath on the nations. So now we have connected opening the door with the idea of the night of vigil and that we're in this action showing our faith in how the night is special will start, you know, the redemption starting, it will bring its merit and it will include the coming of the Messiah and pouring wrath on the nations to increase, and I'm reading, and to increase showing our faith in the coming of the Messiah as if we were all anticipating and waiting for his arrival, though he may delay. And for this, God will hasten our redemption and pour his wrath on the nations. So we have um, this idea that we are doing our part. This is what we want to happen. And we know that there may be delays, but because there are delay, but the delays will not waver our faith. Okay, so we've connected the two elements of opening the door and shvoh hamatcha. The third element is the most complicated. Um, and that is this extra cup of wine. So, we have four cups of wine at the Seder. It is pretty widely known. It is a staple of the Seder. Every person gets the, their own four cups of wine. There are a lot of uh, halachic debates about how it should be drunk, how they should be drunk, what constitutes fulfilling the commandment of these four cups. 
um, during the Seder. But why four? Why is there an option of a fifth? These are very um, complicated and interesting questions. There are over almost two dozen um, I, answers are given to why there could be, why there are da, davka four cups at the Seder. And I, um, <clears throat> and I recommend to you to look for uh, Dr. Lear Jacoby's um, three-part series or even more, very in-depth study of the four cups and the fifth cup. Um, but what we know is that four cups were established already in the Gemara times, and there was an option of a fifth cup. And uh, we have the Rokach in 13th century worms telling us that four cups, I'm paraphrasing the first, uh, the first section here, four cups are mandatory. And the fifth cup is optional. If you want to, you can drink it. When you're saying the section of Halel Hagadol, that means this, the uh, verses of Tehillim said right after uh, the meal during the Seder. And some say that the four cups are representative of the four Galuyot, the four um, cycles of diaspora. And the fifth, symbolizes the redemption. So we already have a hint here that this, this fifth cup is also connected to the concept of redemption that we were talking about. And I brought also a modern summary uh, from Penine Halacha of Rabbi Eliezer Malamed, he explaining um, the, the four cups and how the fifth cup can be an expression of redemption. But this is really just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to say about the four cups and the fifth cup, but it is not our topic this evening. Uh, I just want to, and one of the options for understanding the, the fifth cup, the four cups, is the four um, actions of redemption that are mentioned in the story of the Exodus in, um, in Shemot. We have uh, rescue, okay? We have save, redeem, take, and the last one is bring. Vehotseti, vehitzalti, vegaalti, vilakachti. Those are representative of the four cups, possibly, according to one interpretation. And veheveti. And because heveti is bringing to the land, and that did not happen as part of the Exodus, the first four actions um, were carried out to take um, B'nai Israel out of Egypt. But the fifth one was a promise for the future. And therefore also the four cups, the four that were uh, part, an integral part of the Exodus are drunken at, are drunk during the Seder. And the fifth one that is um, a promise for the future is left and it isn't to be drunken. Now, the cup itself of wine is a symbol of redemption. And it features prominently in illustrated Haggadot from the uh, 15th century. And we, in the second part of this talk, we will talk, I will expand about um, the, how important it is to look at illustrations, to understand what the text is telling us and what and how um, illustrations reflect what people are doing uh, even earlier than it gets recorded in the text. So we have this cup that is central, a chalice that is also a sign of redemption and a promise that um, and a symbol. So all three of these elements independently come together. The cup is standing and waiting, the door is opened, the verses of Shmo Chamatcha are recited all at the same time, and they all point to redemption. But when the Jews in Ashkenaz are opening the door and saying these verses in the cup of wine, the fifth cup of wine is 
ready for a for this redemption to start, who are they waiting for? It all points to the Mashiach, like we've seen in the words of Rabbi Israel Bruna and Mateh Moshe. How come? How did it happen that from waiting for the Messiah, there's a shift to wait for Elijah? What is so special about Elijah that he seems to overshadow the Mashiach? So for that, we have to backtrack a little bit. Mashiach <clears throat> um, needs a mivasil. And that job of harbinger is given to Elijah. And the, um, the basic text that is pointed to over and over and over again are the verses from the last chapter of Malachi that actually are the last verses of the section of Nevi'im of the uh, prophets in Tanakh, okay? So we have this idea that this Eliyah Hanavi is mentioned. Almost all the commentaries say that it is the same Eliyah Hanavi is Eliyahu Hanavi from the Book of Kings. There are very few that say it is someone else. And he is supposed to come in anticipation of the redemption. And um, it's, it, it became a very fundamental and widespread idea that before the redemption, there will be Elijah coming to announce it. So we have that somehow this extra cup shifted and became associated with the cup of Elijah. Now, one uh, widely uh, circulated explanation is that because the uh, Gemara didn't know if there should be four cups or five cups, and when there is a um, debate that they don't know how to decide, they put it on. They put it, you know, on the shelf, and Elijah will until Elijah comes and will tell them the answer. And so we pour the fifth cup, but don't drink it. That is a very nice idea, but it is a modern idea that was suggested in the 20th century. So I went back. I'm, I'm still, um, and and by then we already had the cup of Elijah. So it's, it's a nice uh, explanation, but it doesn't help us understand how, it came, how the cup of Elijah came to be. Um, and we find in 17th century worms, the Shamish of the community writes down a lot of the customs of the community. And he also writes that we're used to, um, we're used to speaking uh, we're used in, in our community, we prepare the cups, one more than the amount of people. And because we want guests to come, we want to be ready for someone to drop by. So we set an extra place and everyone needs four cups. So we make an extra cup and we call it the cup of, of Eliyahu Hanavi because he is the guest that we want most of all. And also, um, the spirit, the problematic elements who can harm, the harmful uh, elements that can bother us run away when we say Elijah's name. So here we already have the connection to the night of vigil that the harmful elements can't bother, you know, the people, the, the, the people of God who are protected on this night. And also we are already coming towards the uh, more modern stories of Elijah um, helping people and protecting people that uh, have been through the ages, but really got a boon in the early modern period when we not, when we actually start recording uh, folk tales. So we have this idea that this is the guest that we want and he needs a cup. But um, Elijah is connected to this cup also by the way that he is connected to the Jewish communities of Ashkenaz in the Middle Ages. 
And one, the most um, important way that Elijah is connected is through Brit Milah, circumcision ceremonies. Now the connection between Elijah and circumcision ceremonies goes through the verses from Malachi and to Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, which is a, a midrash written in eighth century uh, Eretz Israel, and comes to Ashkenaz in the Middle Ages. So here I brought the quote from the 29th chapter of Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. The entire chapter discusses the Brit Milah of um, Avraham of Abraham, and the commandment that uh, Abraham and his descendants should perform the circumcision as a covenant with God. And it goes through the, um, the loyalty of the descendants of Abraham, not all of them, but which descendants were loyal to the covenant and which were not. And it brings through the generations and discusses how um, in Egypt, to be able to bring the sacrifice for Pesach, the Korban Pesach, the first year, they actually needed to do two things. One was the mitzvah of the Korban and one was the mitzvah of Brit Milah. Because the Midrash tells us, is pretty um, consistent in saying that the Israelites did not perform circumcisions while in Egypt. So a prerequisite to be able to leave Egypt was also circumcision. And then we have Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer telling us that they mixed the two bloods. The blood of the circumcision and the blood of the lamb were mixed together and both together were painted on the doorposts. And explains the verse that is recited both at circumcision and during Pesach Seder of the Omar Lach B'damai Chai. And I say to you, because of your blood, you shall live. And in the verse in Yechezkel, it is said twice. So Rabbi Eliezer explains why is it said twice? Because of your blood, you shall live. And because God said, by the merit of the blood of the covenant of circumcision and the blood of the Paschal Lamb, you were redeemed from Egypt. Okay. And the interesting part, by the merit of the covenant of circumcision and by the merit of the covenant of Passover, in the future, you shall be redeemed. So the um, redemptive quality and essence of this blood continues through the generations and carries through to um, the Jewish communities of medieval Ashkenaz. In the same chapter, we have the connection of Elijah to circumcisions because he, um, Elijah come, runs away to the desert and complains to God and says, the Israelites have left the covenant. And the Midrash um, understands his use of the word covenant as the circumcision, covenant of the circumcision. And God says to him, you are too zealous. The Israelites shall not observe the covenant of circumcision until you see it done with your own eyes. So now Elijah has to come to each and every circumcision to see that he was wrong and that the um, Jewish, uh, Jewish people continue to perform this um, ritual of covenant with God. Hence the sages instituted the custom that people should have a seat of honor for the Malacha Brit, the messenger of the covenant, because Elijah is called the messenger of the covenant, as it is said, and this is the first verse of the same chapter of Malachi, and behold, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he approaches. And it is connected straight away to hasten and hasten and bring the Messiah in our lifetime to comforts. So we have this direct line to um, Elijah, the Malach Habrit, the, the messenger or the angel of the covenant, also being the uh, forerunner of the Messiah and 
he's coming to every circumcision. And that's connected to the blood of the circumcision and the blood of Passover. So all these different elements are in the background. But how did it connect to actually opening the door for Elijah and presenting him with a cup of wine? Now we go to art. Um, illustrated Haggadot from the 15th century are full of details about how the um, communities who created these Haggadot and purchased them, uh, how they saw themselves, how they understood um, the rituals, how they read the Bible and Midrash, and how um, they envisioned redemption. And a lot of times, certain elements um, found their expression first in art, and only later found their way into official documentation of scholars and how to do them um, into the literature of how you do things. They came, they were done. They were, a snapshot was taken as if uh, pictures were taken of people doing things. They were recorded in art. And then they, when people did them enough, it was already written down as this is what you do. So in terms of looking at pictures of redemption, from very early on, it's a very special Haggadah um, called the Bird's Head Haggadah or the Griffin Head Haggadah, according to Mark Michael Epstein. Uh, it's fairly early. And the scene showing redemption is this idea of a Jerusalem, an other world, a different kind of reality. But when we move to the 15th century, we have much more concrete ideas. And we see here in these two Haggadot that we are almost identical. And they were probably produced in the same workshop alongside each other. And um, you see at the, on the very, very last page of the Haggadot, you see this redemption happening. Uh, and you have Elijah on the side blowing a shofar, and you have the Messiah on the bottom leading people, leading people out. He's riding uh, uh, a horse or a donkey, and, and people are walking after him. So here we already have movement. It's not this idea of some sort of Jerusalem that may be physical, may be um, spiritual, but it's actually a Messiah with a harbinger of Elijah, moving people out. In these same Haggadot, a few pages earlier, we have Elijah, uh, we have the Messiah knocking on the door, okay? We have coming to the door. The previous scene is when you've already left. And here, it's, it's when they're presenting themselves and they're knocking on the door. And this idea of how to uh, visualize redemption carried through to um, to print. This is one of the first printed Haggadot. So we have this idea that um, that the redemption is more concrete. We have a more of um, expectations of what we want to happen. Hence, pour out your wrath we have more of an, a concept who we want our actors to be. We have Mashiach and we have Elijah. And we want and we are portraying the redemption happening closer and closer to home. I only brought you a few examples. There are more from all kinds of different um, styles and um, and, and scribes and artists, but these elements pretty much stay the same. The house, the uh, Mashiach coming, sometimes riding on a horse, sometimes on foot with, and, and, and in, in some of them, Elijah is walking before them. 
I'm just gonna say, state that when you have one figure in these Haggadot, it is Mashiach. When you have two, then one of them is Aliyah. And if you have one, it's not Aliyah. Okay. So now that we have seen what the visualization is, why do we want um, Aliyah to come and we're not putting out a cup for Mashiach? So the thing about Eliyahu is that he can come and go, okay? He can be uh, present at every brit, and the Mashiach isn't coming with him. So when you open the door for Mashiach at the Seder, you've got a sum zero game. Either he's there or he's not. And if he's there, great, everything changes. And if he's not, what do you do? You've shown this show of faith. Opening the door is this ultimate, uh, like we saw in the sources, this ultimate thing, we are ready. We are showing that we are holding our, up our end of the deal. Now we're left with an empty doorstep. It's crushing. But Elijah can go up and back. Sometimes he's coming with the Mashiach, but sometimes a lot of the time, he's coming to check up on his Jews. He's coming to check up on the children of God. And that is okay. If you open the door and Elijah's coming to check on you, and maybe he'll see a problem and you're having a specific, this community is having difficulties around this specific Passover. And maybe some influence from Elijah will make things better. So it is, um, it is helpful that even if the Mashiach isn't coming on his heels, that, that Elijah himself will come. Now, this idea of Elijah checking up is also um, portrayed in his um, character as a dog. And where does this come from? So you see in one of these uh, illustrations, you see the donkey coming in, and we know that the donkey is, you know, Chamorosh el Mashiach, this idea that the, don that the Mashiach will come in riding on a donkey. And then there's a, a dog standing behind the, the um, youth who's opening the door. And I was thinking, where does this dog come from? And it's not the only one. I found at least um, four examples of this dog there during opening the door for Elijah. And then I found that in, already in the Talmud, our, our rabbis teach that when dogs frolic, it is a sign that Elijah the prophet has come to town. And I dug and dug and dug, and I find all these connections between dog and Elijah. And this is just a schematic connection of a gematria as they go on. But what is Elijah's role? What is it? No, no, no. So he, so he has the same connection to a dog. What does it help us with opening the door and wanting there to be someone on the doorstep? So here's his role as the guard dog of Israel. And here um, you have a picture that is from a, um, a guide to a hunt, okay? This idea that the dogs go with the nobleman on a hunt. And here you have the Messiah as the nobleman. Okay, he's, he's, he's the leader. He's this wonderful noble figure who is leading his, um, his people and the people he's responsible for out of Egypt. And Elijah is calling in front of him. And he is just like the herald um, calls before the nobleman on the hunt and goes before him. And I looked also at how dogs were thought of during the Middle Ages. And one of the things that was very, that came up very um, strongly was that how much they are loyal and take care of the house and flock of their masters. And if um, Elijah is the, uh, the, the guard dog sent by God 
to um, protect his flock, especially during the night of vigil, during the time that they're anticipating a good change, a protection, a um, redemption is in the air. So it might not be the Messiah that is coming, but God sends the forerunner. He sends the protector who will take care of things for now. And he is noticing the commitment of continuing to practice the Seder, of continuing to practice the covenant of uh, Brit Milah, the covenant of Matzah. And Elijah has an opportunity to come and check in, check up, see what's going on, and maybe solve some local issues and also report back and say, see, they have merited, their faith has merited redemption. And maybe that will bring that next year, he will be coming and actually um, proclaiming the coming of Messiah on his heels. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, Hannah. That was definitely enlightening. I was waiting to see the explanation about the puppies in your uh, presentation. Um, um, if anyone has questions for Dr. Hannah Shachmorski, this is the time. Um, there was a question at the beginning. Uh, Patricia wanted to know how is the night of Passover related to creation? Oh, okay. So um, that is a very good question. The idea is that this night was, was scheduled ahead of time. Now, during in the creation, um, um, God already put it in the calendar that, that on this night, the redemption from Egypt would happen. And, um, um, and so it, that's the idea that this, this night was already preordained from creation to be something special. Does that answer the question? Um, why? Why don't you read out the question yeah. also, Hannah? Yeah. Because okay. So there's one question about one of the illustrations of a woman carrying something on her head. If I remember correctly, it is one of the illustrations of leaving Egypt is probably carrying a pack um, of packing up. Um, the question of Yak Nahaz is a very interesting one. Uh, and I'd like to uh, talk about it like that, talk about it in a bit. Um, the, this year, because the Seder is on Saturday night, so the beginning of the, um, the Haggadah, which is Kadesh, making Kiddush on, on, on the Seder night, is also doubles as Havdalah from Shabbat. So um, th there is a special um, acronym so that we remember the order of the blessings we have to say when we are double duty on the same cup of wine. It is also the first cup of wine, it is also Kiddush, and it is also Havdalah. So the acronym is Yakna Haz. Now, um, there was an idea put forth in a uh, book about Yiddish and its connection to, to the German language in the 1950s, um, suggesting that the sound of the acronym also sounds like Yagen Haz, which means um, the hunt of the rabbits, the hare, the hunt, hunting the hare. And that uh, the sound, uh, the, that it sounds the same, was used, was suggested that that's an explanation of pictures of hunting scenes around um, Kadesh, around the first page of the Haggadah, um, that the, the, the hunting scene of the hare was chosen because it will be a, uh, a, a memory trigger to remember to say the Yakna has blessings. Um, however, this uh, hunting scene it appears in other places, it is a decorative scene from Christian art and from Jewish art. This is just, you know, a, um, a model that's used for decoration. Um, the Jewish interpretation of it is more when the Jews are the hare or the Jews are the doe being chased. Um, 
by um, by forces that are uh, um, uh, going to harm them. But, and it appears in other places in Haggadot, it appears in other manuscripts, liturgical manuscripts, Mechazorim. It also appears in um, Spanish manuscripts, which wouldn't call it a Yagen has. So it is a cute idea, but um, it doesn't really hold up to the, to the uh, manuscripts themselves. Um, the three things, um, also, if anybody wants to uh, look at uh, the dogs more, um, and the, the idea of the connection between Elijah and dogs more broadly, um, there is an article I wrote um, about it in 2016. You can just um, Google Elijah the prophet guard dog of Israel and it should pop up. Um, it is connected to all kinds of concepts of um, dogs being a symbol of nobility, but also dogs being a symbol of filth and rabies and, 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 and problematic things. So it is a very complicated symbol that works against Jews, for Jews, against Christians, for Christians. It is, it is a matrix of symbolism that Elijah sits right in the middle. So um, we can talk about that a different time. Um, and there's more uh, chases. My question is, and okay. Um, there are a lot of decorative elements also. One of the interesting things about manuscript art is trying to figure out what the decorative elements are and what are the, um, and what the um, meaningful parts are. So sometimes you'll have this great idea and then you'll look at a bunch of other manuscripts and, and the meaning that you thought to associate with a particular item um, doesn't really hold up because it doesn't fit along, looking along other manuscripts. The whole idea of um, a lot of times you have to compare the text to the art to see if you're looking at decoration or looking at something that has more meaning and a lot of times it correlates with the text. Okay. Um, I had a wonderful time speaking to all of you. Thank you very uh, much for preparing us for, uh, for our guests. And, um, anyone who has a dog now, at least maybe we should know what the dog should be part of the ceremony of opening the door for Eliyahu and yeah, we, we have a little uh, puppy um, um, plush doll sitting next to our Elijah cup. It is a very nice, uh, I've heard of all kinds of nice things I've brought in. And um, there's, I've just given you the tibet, the highlights, and every idea here is can is um, vast and can be looked at from multiple directions. And I encourage you to enrich your uh, your preparations for Pesach with um, looking at elements of the Haggadah that you didn't uh, think that were hiding so much meaning behind them before. Great, thank you very much. Um... So you said to look up, look up your lecture on Eliyahu Navi and dogs. I'm responding to Debbie who was looking for tips. So um, any notes? Um, well, uh, I, there's um, very interesting things on the Beit Avichai website that I saw popping up. Um, uh, so, um, I have an article on Segula Magazine's website that popped up. Um, there's uh, the fifth cup, the fourth cup, and the fifth cup is uh, Dr. Uh, Lior Jacobi. Um, uh, there is a video from the um, there's there's things from the National Library and from the Israel Museum about different kinds of Haggadot. So there's lots and lots of content, and you can take an hour while uh, you're resting from cleaning and and look look things up. <laughs> 